Good evening, and welcome to the March 19th meeting of the Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission. Please rise and follow me with the Pledge of the Allegiance, please. Mrs. Zambrano, can you please call the roll? Chair Lemo? Here. Vice Chair Engler? Here. Commissioner Gregory? Here. Commissioner McMahon? Here. And Commissioner Reeder is absent. Thank you. Any person who wishes to speak regarding an item on the agenda or on a subject within the city's jurisdiction during the public comments portion of the agenda must file a public speaker card I just want to make sure I read that right. With the recording secretary before that portion of the agenda is called. Any person who wishes to speak on a specific agenda item must file a public speaker card before the specific item is called. Persons addressing the traffic commission are requested to state their name and city of residence for the record. Under state law, issues presented or introduced under public comments can have no action and will be referred to the Traffic Engineering Division Manager for administrative action or scheduled on a subsequent agenda. It would be appreciated if you'd please silence all your uh, cell phones during the meeting, um, or at least put them on uh, the vibrate mode, I guess. Uh, as a reminder, there is not to be any dialogue between the audience and the commissioners at any time as uh, Thousand Oaks Television can only record your comments when speaking into the microphone uh, from the podium there. Should you need to step away from the podium while speaking, uh, if you're doing a presentation of some kind, a wireless microphone will be provided for you. Uh, and uh, before we begin uh, our public comments, we have a few items on our agenda to take care of. And one of which is uh, I'm going to request that uh, Sergeant Rick Harwood meet me at the uh, podium over here. Uh, this is not the Thousand Oaks version of Dancing with the Stars or Dancing with the Cops, but I'll meet you there anyway. Good, how are you? Good. Uh, so, am I? Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna use this one because okay. you're so much taller than me. <laughs> you're better looking. <laughs> well, not when you're in the room. Anyway, uh, this is uh, Sergeant Harwood's last meeting, and I'm gonna go ahead and quickly read the whereas is it's a commendation in honor of Rick Harwood. Sergeant Rick Harwood began attending the Thousand Oaks Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission in July of 2009, serving until 2014. Sergeant Harwood has provided countless hours of service to the City of Thousand Oaks by attending traffic commission meetings and has provided inv invaluable input on traffic-related issues, including traffic safety issues at schools, speed hump requests, traffic calming measures, speeding concerns, bicycle projects, site distance restrictions, ordinance changes on speed limits, oversized vehicle parking ordinance, truck routes, preferential parking permit districts, stop sign installations, and the city's, the city's crossing guard program. And he's given out a few speeding tickets from his motorcycle as well. Sergeant Harwood's contribution as a Thousand Oaks Police Department staff representative to the city's Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission have proven to be an invaluable resource in the city's decision-making process. Now, therefore, I, Rick Lemo, chair of the city of Thousand Oaks, Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission on behalf of our entire Traffic and Transportation Advisory Commission commend Sergeant Rick Harwood for his dedication and many contributions over the last five years to the enhancement of our community. And Sergeant Howard, thank you very, very much. Thank you Great very job. much. I appreciate it. That's nice. That's for you and my oh, phone no. is yours. This is the second speech I've had to give today and I'm not a good speech giver. Um, just real quickly, I just wanted to say thank you very much. I didn't expect this. Uh, my good friend, Mr. Mashiko, didn't tell me. Uh, um, but I've really enjoyed my time here in Thousand Oaks. I've enjoyed getting to know the commissioners. Um, it's been a lot of fun. I've been in Thousand Oaks 12 of my 23 years, so I'm really going to miss it. I'm going to an assignment in Ojai. Um, it's due to 
no fault of my own, but just natural rotation, uh, give somebody else an opportunity to have the job that I've been blessed to have for the last five years. Um, but I've truly enjoyed working with all of you, and it's been a lot of fun. So thank you very much. And thank you again. And that is uh, one of the nicest last things to have to do as chair. And uh, so what we're going to do before we move on with our agenda uh, is to elect our new chair. And I am going to entertain uh, a nomination from our uh, commissioners for our next uh, traffic chair. Well, I would nominate uh, uh, Commissioner Engler, if she would so be inclined. Excellent. Any comments? We, I don't believe that we do. All right. Then uh, what I'm going to do is uh, ask for uh, a roll call vote on the uh, nomination of uh, Susan Engler, our vice chair, as chair for the term expiring in January of 2015. All those in favor, please say aye. Commissioner McMahon? Aye. Commissioner Gregory? Aye. Chair Lemo? Aye. The motion, par excuse me, carries. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't get to vote for herself? Okay, and uh, now um, we're going to uh, uh, entertain the election of our new vice chair, and uh, well, Good part of time, I sort of refrain from this. I am going to make a nomination, and my nomination for vice chair would be, um, even though she looks like the youngest member on the board, um, our longest serving member, uh, and so my nomination for vice chair is Commissioner Sharon McMahon. Will you accept? Yes. Okay. We're ready for the vote. Yes, please. Well. The nominations? No. Okay. May we take a hand vote on this? Sure. All those in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries. Excellent. So um, to save time, should we just switch signs or should we switch seats? Which do you prefer? Ladies? Finally, we have two women in charge, which is where we, where we were when I was on the commission, and it never ran better. So I'm sure it will run very well now. And with that, uh, Chair Engler will pick up our agenda with uh, item number six. All right. Um, thank you. And uh, we move into item, item six, which is public comments. Uh, each person will be given three minutes. Uh, the recording secretary will set the timer accordingly. The green light on the timer will be begin counting down the three minutes. When the yellow light is displayed, you will have one minute left. So please begin wrapping up your thoughts. The red light indicates that your three minutes are up. So please stop speaking. Uh, but remain at the podium uh, if, should there be questions from commissioners, if any. Okay. Um, I'm going to start calling the, the uh, speaker cards. Uh, when you come, when I call you forward, please state your name and city of residence. And our first speaker is T.C. Simmons. Sorry, commissioners. J.C. Simmons. It's, it's the way I write. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening, City of Thousand Oaks. I'm here to talk about several things in relationship to, guess what, bicycles. Um, talked with Caltrans back in January about the new Wendy Road overpass and a few problems that I saw. They were out today doing a review and consultation with the providers, and there will be some corrective measures taken. Um, I think those are very positive. May 10th, we have cruising the Caneo coming to town after, uh, before the tour, I think, and or right in conjunction with the tour of California. 
Uh, historically, for those who don't know, about 1,000 to 1,500 cyclists come from all over the state to ride our beautiful roads and mountains on their road bikes. So it's a great money generator for the club, great money generator for the city, and a great event for cyclists. On May 21st, we have the Ride of Silence. This is the city's seventh annual Ride of Silence. Cyclists of all ages and abilities. It's going to be a solemn procession from the lakes here, down around through Westlake, back over through Jan's Mall, back to the city, uh, back to the lakes, in uh, solemn memory of cyclists killed on the roads. There's over 600 a year killed on the roads in the United States. It's inexcusable. It's not necessary. Pay attention when you drive. We'll be there demonstrating that we're traffic too. Thank you, commissioners. Any questions? Thank you, JC. Thank you. Okay, now we move to item seven, our summary notes of January 29th. Uh, we have them attached to the agenda. Uh, commissioners, did you have any comments or questions? All right, so um, so a item 8A, and so do I ask, do you provide a staff report now? You're going to have to help me walk through my first meeting. Uh, sure. Officially, so pardon me. Uh, thank you, Chair Angler. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Angler, members of the commission. I'm Larry Tay, and for your consideration this evening is an in information item related to a proposed intersection reconfiguration and left turn pocket extension um, on northbound Westlake Boulevard approaching the intersection of Avenida de los Arbolas. Uh, the purpose of this presentation really is to receive the staff report um, and, and to receive public input as well as for the commission to provide their comments on the project as well. I want to um, stress it is not an action item. Uh, here's a location map. Uh, the project area is highlighted um, and the affected area is northbound Westlake Boulevard appro approaching Avenida de los Arbolas. A uh, project area is shown in purple. Um, uh, it's bounded by Avenida de los Arboles to the north and Lang Ranch Parkway to the south. Uh, for additional perspective, here's a view of the Westlake and Arboles intersection. The vehicles that are actually facing us are approaching the intersection uh, heading northbound, and the nearest upstream intersection is Lang Ranch Parkway. It's in the background and it's circled for your reference. Uh, this diagram here shows the existing northbound lane configurations. As you can see, there are three lanes going from left to right. The number one lane, which is the leftmost lane, is an exclusive left turn lane. The number two lane, or the center lane, is also an exclusive left turn lane. And the number three lane, the rightmost curbside lane, is currently what we refer to as a combination lane. That allows motorists to go left, through, or make a right turn through the intersection. Uh, under this particular configuration, uh, the intersection was on the city's list of top 10 accident locations for much of the past eight years, at times holding the number one spot. And a review of that accident data uh, show that a significant number of the intersection's accidents and collisions actually involve uh, northbound left-turning vehicles. Uh, there are a couple of conflicts, two of which are vehicle to vehicle, one of which is vehicle to bicycle. I'm going to go through those one by one. Um, as you can see on this screen, uh, conflict number one is a situation where a vehicle begins to turn left from the number two or center lane. So that would be uh, vehicle B. And in the middle of his, it, the turn, that vehicle starts to drift to the right-hand lane, not expecting that uh, that vehicle C is also turning left from the adjacent lane. And that causes a potential uh, conflict, as you can see, uh, represented by the star in the, in the illustration. Um, another potential conflict type is a situation where a vehicle attempts to proceed straight through the intersection from the center lane. 
a lot of motorists uh, d- do not anticipate the triple left turn configuration despite the, the, the signage that's that's been installed and implemented. And the number two lane, while designated as left turn only, it aligns almost perfectly with the receiving through lane on the far side of the intersection, which can cause some motorist confusion. And as you can see, there's a potential conflict between vehicles A and C. Uh, the third such conflict uh, involves a uh, vehicle to bicycle conflict. And in order for cyclists to actually make a left turn um, and end up in the bike lane on Avenida de los Arbolas, they must start from a position to the right of that combination lane. Well, the conflict arises because there are, a car in that combination lane can go straight through, which requires a cyclist to make a left turn across a through moving vehicle potentially. And uh, the aforementioned conflicts can be reduced by, reconf- uh, at, uh, reduced by reconfiguring the northbound approach to not allow left turn movements from that rightmost number three lane. The resulting configuration is shown in this picture. And as you can see, uh, the curbside lane uh, would be dedicated for through moving and right turning vehicles only. So uh, what, what would be the benefits of, of reconfiguring the intersection? Uh, well, obviously, there, there's the reduction in, in conflicts and, and collisions, as we previously discussed. Um, and the expected safety benefits of this project are actually validated by the city applying for and receiving a very competitive grant. It's a Highway Safety Improvement Program grant, and those funds are only awarded to projects that are expected to have a significant positive result. We're also able to maintain level of service A with the proposed reconfiguration. Um, and we're also able to improve the traffic signal's efficiency. The existing combination lane requires a very inefficient traffic signal sequencing. Because of the shared lane, all the ve- we have to serve all the vehicles going northbound before we can serve all the vehicles going southbound. North and southbound through and left turn movements cannot move concurrently under this particular lane configuration. That adds to the inefficiency. That inefficiency can be mitigated by reconfiguring the intersection. This, in turn by improving the intersection uh, efficiency will actually reduce the frequency of queued vehicles blocking the upstream intersection at Lang Ranch Parkway. So there's a list of benefits um, that extend far beyond just the immediate intersection itself. Uh, Here's a plan view schematic of the existing roadway. Uh, Currently there's approximately 1,500 feet of available left turn queue storage between all three lanes, number one, number two, and half of the Uh, number three lane. The remainder of the number three lane often serves through and right turning traffic, so we can't count the entire length for left turn storage. Uh, By modifying lane configurations and eliminating left turns from that right hand lane, there would be a corresponding reduction in queue storage capacity. Well, one solution to offset this loss of capacity is to actually extend the number one inside left turn pocket. And as you can see in this plan view representation, the number one turn lane currently is relatively short. It's actually only about 150 feet long. So here, here's the first option uh, to, to extend the number one left turn. It's to ex- extend the number one left turn pocket as far back as it goes. And it would provide approximately the same queue storage that as existing conditions if we went with this particular alternative. And it best accommodates any future traffic volume increases. And moreover, this option further reduces the probability of queues backing up into Lang Ranch Parkway. One drawback, however, is that it would require the removal of all the trees that are currently in uh, the median island right now. However, none of these trees are oak trees or protected species. And any trees that are, uh, that, that are removed would be replaced at another location uh, to be determined by the city's landscape maintenance division. And just for perspective, here are the trees that are, that are being discussed, and that would be as affected. Uh, the second option is to lengthen the number one left turn pocket uh, to about 400 feet, uh, providing approximately 80 to 85 percent of the intersection's existing left turn storage capacity. However, this reduction in storage capacity could actually be offset with the signal timing changes and improvements that we could make by the reconfiguration. It also provides all the same safety benefits of option number one and allows for preservation of about approximately 10 of the trees that are currently in the median. Uh, The one drawback to this particular option is that it allows for less flexibility to adapt to future traffic volume increases. And this slide just gives some perspective of a typical uh, back of queue during the evening peak period. Um, This is is fairly typical for the queue to reach a little more than halfway uh, back from Arbelez to Lang Ranch Parkway. And unless the commission objects, uh, staff will proceed with design 
for option one uh, due to uh, the following expected benefits as I said before, a reduction in collisions, improved efficiency, a maximization of storage capacity, ability to accommodate future uh, traffic volumes, um, and we will be able to mitigate some of those landscaping impacts. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, I'm going to open up to commissioners with questions. Yeah, uh, what kind of time frame will this take place? Uh, yes, um, good, good question. Th this is a federally funded project, so there are certain requirements. There are grant compliance requirements that kind of extend uh, the, 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 the process a little bit. Um, we're, 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 we'd be looking at completing design relatively in the, in the next five to six months and possibly starting construction within and, and finishing construction within the next year. And again, that's contingent upon uh, Caltrans, which is a grant administrator, uh, providing us timely approvals during the process. That's great. I, I, and I fully support this project. I've been in this traffic. I've seen it firsthand. The stacking, the conflicts. Uh, I mean, it takes a good driver to make that left-hand turn in that center lane. <laughs> we don't always have good drivers in it, unfortunately. <laughs> so I commit, you know, I support this totally. Commissioner Lemo? Um, uh, I agree with everything that, uh, that uh, 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 my commissioner uh, said. However, I have one question, that I, and, I, and I wonder if I'm missing something. I saw... Bef way, the way it exists now, what the challenge was for bicyclists. How will a bicyclist make a left-hand turn? Will there be a special bike lane between two and three that will allow them to go straight with traffic or make a left turn with traffic? In other words, how will bikes be handled? Commissioner Lemo, that, that's a very good question. It's, it's something that we can look into during the final design phase, whether or not there's enough pavement out there um, to, to provide for a left turn bicycle lane. Um, but even if there's not the ability to provide a left turn bicycle lane because of existing constraints, the cyclists turning left always have the option of positioning themselves between the number two and number three lanes, complete their left turn without the, without the conflicts that they currently are faced with under the existing configurations. And we don't. We no longer are perpetuating the Shero type lanes, where you could literally have lane two be a Shero lane with bike as well as left turn. Uh, Sharos are typically uh, applied on curbside lanes, and the number the number two lane in this case would be the the media, against the median island. Probably not the most uh, best place for a Shero application. Thank you very much. I I agree. Um, I support it. Mr. Uh, Commissioner McMahon. Um, I have ridden that intersection and made that left turn with a group of cyclists. And unless you're made aware of it by another cyclist, you're warned, you don't see it coming. You don't realize how dangerous it is and, it is and what the potential conflict is. So I, I heartily agree with it. And what... Um, what a cyclist would probably do is just stay in the furthest uh, left-hand turn lane because they could make that turn and go to the to the curbside lane um, as they made the turn without worrying about another car to their right turning in front of them or into them. And um, it's 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 a great idea. It's a great change. I wholeheartedly support it. I have a question. Um, you mentioned, and I've seen the um, uh, the left turn, the left turning vehicles that actually don't know how to end up in their appropriate lane because there's so much space. I get, I guess, I can see how it happens. Um, but even so, with two lanes, with two lanes that are turning left, uh, do you anticipate? I think one thing that we could be doing is we could be striping within. You know, dotted lines or something, I don't know if it's against the law, but something where it indicates where those cars, how they stay on their track and in their lane. That's a, that's a very good point, and if you dr uh, drive through the intersection, um, I believe there are what we refer to as cat track markings. They provide guidance for drivers uh, as they're turning to be able to stay in their respective lanes. Um, as part of this project, those markings will be um, refurbished to be more visible and enhanced. 
Um, I also just wanted to add one more thing for the record, if it's okay with you, uh, Chair Engler. Um, we, we, we did receive a number of um, uh, emails from, from, from residents in, in support of this project. Uh, I don't know the exact number, but I believe a, a copy was distributed to each of the commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Tay. Um, now I'm going to um, move to um, the portion where we have spe uh, speaker comments. Um, let me get to my right place. Okay. Anyone wishing to address the commission on this agenda uh, item may do so by filling out a purple speaker card or a blue written statement card. Is there anyone who wishes to address the council, uh, commission who has not filled out a card? Oh, you go ahead. Do you want to fill out a card? Fill out a card first. You need to fill out a card. He can fill out a card while he's speaking. Mm -hmm. while, while we have speaking, I'll allow you to fill out your card. All right. Okay, speakers are allotted five minutes each. And our speaker for this item is Mr. Bishop. Is it Stephen or it Stephen? Is Stephen? Stephen, thank you. And good evening, commissioners. Um, I am here, first of all, to show support for this. Just right off the bat, I'll tell you that. Uh, my name is Stephen Bishop. I am resident of Thousand Oaks. Uh, my wife and I have actually lived here since 1998, and we live about 100 yards from this very intersection. Uh, so we have had plenty of time to observe the effects of the uh, the traffic situation there. In fact, when we first moved in, that was controlled by a four-way stop, and that was very exciting. Uh, it is unfortunately continuing to be exciting with the aftermath of the accidents which we have seen there. Uh, and back in September, I actually wrote up a report of my own, just a request, sort of analyzing the problems that we saw there, and I contacted Mr. Mashiko. He put me in touch with Mr. Tay, who advised me that they were way ahead of me on this and that they had already uh, begun developing this plan, uh, which goes beyond what I was requesting. I was simply requesting changing it back down to the initial two left turn lanes that it had uh, before it was expanded to the three lane with a combination lane configuration. Uh, and he told me about the, the plan to lengthen the left turn pocket, increase the amount of storage, and so forth. So just in general, they, I, I think that this plan is an excellent idea. I think it's going to go a long way toward making that intersection safer. I agree with everything that uh, the, the commissioners and Mr. Tay have, uh, have already commented on this. So I look forward to this uh, getting started. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is J.C. Simmons. Please state your name and place of residence. <clears throat> Again, J.C. Simmons, uh, resident of Newberry Park, avid cyclist. I remember when that intersection, and in, in Mr. Tay had failed to mention that historically it was two left turn lanes and a common lane going forward, and the far lane to the, the number four lane was right turn only into the, into the homes there. Uh, they changed that to the con current configuration when they were doing the 23 expansion years ago, and it just it raised havoc with the cycling community because of all the conflicts it caused that's been talked about. I mean, you got to take that lane to the far uh, to the far right, and now you got traffic behind you that wants to go straight. You want to turn left, um, and it's not a fair fight between a car and a cyclist. So. Uh, I support the, the move completely. Uh, we need to go back to the way it was. Thank you. And I'd like to um, state for the record that we received three uh, email communications, one of which from Mr. Bishop, um, all uh, in the affirmative for the change in the intersection to uh, remove the three left turn lanes. Um, and I, I do want to compliment Mr. Bishop, I mean, everyone was very articulate. Um, and Mr. Bishop actually spent a lot of time crafting diagrams that he could have shared with the city for our presentation. It was stunning. Each one of you should have a copy. Uh, so anyway, thank, I like to uh, acknowledge uh, the citizens who participated however they did. Okay. Okay, now we move on to item 8B. The Hillcrest Drive restriping proposal, phase one. Um, 
Thank you, uh, Chair Angler. Uh, good evening. Larry Tay again. Um, for your consideration uh, is an information item uh, re related to the Hillcrest Drive restriping project. Um, as with the previous presentation this evening, uh, the intent of this is to provide a status report to the commissioners as well as solicit commission feedback and public input. And the project components that are discussed this evening can be, uh, can be modified uh, b based upon the input that uh, staff receives. I uh, just want to start with a quick background. Um, uh, there have been some long-standing traffic concerns along various segments of Hillcrest Drive, and um, the city w was awarded a little bit of grant money and is scheduled to do some future repaving along certain parts of the street. Um, and that uh, equ equaled um, uh, an opportunity an opportunity to either make some changes if, if the community felt necessary or an opportunity to put things back in exactly the way they are. Um, and in October 2013, staff actually began a focused outreach campaign uh, in the Greenwich Village area, just west of the 23 freeway, uh, to gauge interest in restriping the roadway. Um, there was a door-to-door -door, door -door campaign uh, through the neighborhood. Um, there was a neighborhood meeting, and both of those outreach efforts yielded uh, considerably strong support for what's referred to as a 4-to-3 conversion taking the existing four-lane roadway, having two lanes in each direction, and modifying it to a single lane in each direction with the center turn lane, bike lanes, and parking lanes on each side. Um, staff did present a potential project to the Traffic Commission back in October. The uh, Commission subsequently directed staff to expand the public outreach efforts related to the project, and in November, staff held a follow-up meeting with the Greenwich Village residents, uh, the results of which confirmed interest in some restriping to be done. Uh, moving forward to December of last year, City Council authorized final design activities for the Hillcrest Driver Striping Project. Uh, in January and February of this year, staff actually expanded the outreach to include uh, the, the predominantly residential and institutional areas east of Hoden Camp, going all the way to Duesenberg Drive. Uh, meetings were held with stakeholders along the corridor, uh, including leadership of three schools, religious, three religious institutions, a number of HOAs, and two general community, me community meetings. And all in all, I believe I attended maybe 11 or 12 uh, outreach meetings. Um, these outreach meetings actually yielded uh, three alternatives from the stakeholders um, and the alternatives that were developed are shown on the screen um, in the center is a do-nothing alternative where we have an existing four-lane section with a double yellow center line uh, down the roadway uh, to the left we see that four to three conversion uh, characterized uh, by deleting a travel lane in each direction and adding a center turn lane and bicycle lanes and to the right um, is a, what's referred to as a four to five conversion characterized by adding a center turn lane um, but deleting parking on both sides of the street to preserve two lanes of travel in each direction and this, this matrix uh, really clearly shows that any striping configuration that's adopted, uh, whether it's existing conditions or making a change, represents a compromise. Uh, in the left-hand column are key roadway features that residents have identified as, as key design and street elements they would like to see. And each of the next three columns shows the different alternatives and what each can provide. And as you can see, no one alternative can provide all the desired features. And some takeaways from the outreach campaign so far is that uh, there's a lot of people who, who want a center turn lane um, rather than a center line median treatment for these residential areas of Hillcrest. And um, if we break up those resi residential areas into two segments, from Hoden Camp to the 23 Freeway and then east of the 23 Freeway, um, we, we, we kind of see uh, some mixed results. Um, the area between Hoden Camp and 23 Freeway, which, which was our ground zero for the outreach, uh, there was considerable support for that 4-3 to three conversion, and as such, uh, we're looking into and recommending that it be included at, in, in phase one of the project. For the other segments east of the 23, uh, no strong consensus has yet been achieved. We're continuing to analyze alternatives. We're going to be uh, continuing to uh, continue the dialogue and outreach efforts with those stakeholders in those areas, and it will become those segments would become candidates uh, for a possible phase two of this Hillcrest Drive restriping project. Um, so this map shows phase one. Um, it's comprised of, again, two segments. Um, Houghton Camp to the 23, which is the segment to the right of, of, of the diagram, and then Lynn Road to Camino dos Rios, which is kind of in, uh, at the west end of town. And other segments of Hillcrest are not actually going to be discussed this evening. 
Now, west of Lynn Road, um, Hillcrest Drive is characterized by lower driveway density, uh, segments of raised median, and, and some commercial uses. This really precludes the consideration of any travel lane modifications or reductions, and it precludes the necessity or even the feasibility of a center turn lane. And therefore, the changes that are being recommended and considered for this two-and-a-half-mile-long segment um, to the left side of your screen uh, are, are limited to bicycle facility enhancements. Um, Improving vi the bicycle facilities can potentially reduce vehicle trips and increase comfort levels for road users by creating a sense of separation between the modes of travel. Uh, this figure actually also shows potential improvements that could be made in certain areas along that two-and-a-half-mile stretch. Um, it, it, those improvements include adding dedicated bike lanes or shared lane share markings um, or improving the, the bicycle signage in that area. Um, there are also some narrow spots where minor street improvements could be made to, to accommodate more continuous bike lanes. And those narrow spots are also shown in the figure. And uh, as we proceed into final design, we'll have a more definitive uh, concept in terms of exactly what, what these design elements would consist of. And the second component of phase one is a segment that runs through Greenwich Village. Here's a zoomed in uh, view of that segment. It's approximately half a mile long, fronted by detached uh, residential units. It has a fairly high res uh, density of, of driveways. And shown here is actually uh, Hillcrest Drive near its intersection with Houston Drive, close to the center of that project segment. Uh, the striping shown here is typical of the area, marked for two lanes in each direction, separated by a double yellow, double yellow center line. Uh, no striped bike lanes and parking is permitted, uh, but unmarked. Left turns into driveways and side streets are actually made from the number one travel lane. There is no refuge that's provided. And uh, historically, uh, residents of this segment have expressed concern over pedestrian and traffic safety. And in 2003, City Council actually directed staff to investigate some of these reported concerns, including pedestrians crossing Hillcrest, crash experience, uh, including but not limited to rear end and side swipe collisions, uh, and, and vehicle speeds. Staff had implemented a number of countermeasures uh, included in, in, the, in the list shown on the slide. Uh, but the, the collision rates uh, still remain uh, higher than average. And many of those uh, aforementioned concerns, including collisions, can be actually further mitigated uh, by the implementation of, of that four to three conversion, uh, that restriping concept. Here, here is an actual picture of a, of a four to three conversion uh, that actually took place, I believe this is um, Jan, J on Jan's Road. And as you can see, it's very similar. It's, it's ex exactly how I described it before, center turn lane, one lane in each direction, bike lanes, and a parking lane. And there's a number of advantages to that. Um, in addition to reducing vehicle conflicts and collisions, it can actually improve access because of that turning refuge it provides. Uh, it also tends to improve visibility by shifting the traveled way closer to the center of the street. This allows vehicles entering the roadway from the side streets to actually advance further into the intersection when beginning their turn. That actually opens up sight lines. It's also more bicycle and pedestrian friendly. Um, not all streets are good candidates for uh, restriping. Uh, this, hill, this particular segment of Hillcrest, um, however, is, as it satisfies some key characteristics, has sufficient width, um, and the average daily traffic volumes on the project segment are below 20,000 vehicles per day, which is the uh, commonly acceptable threshold uh, in terms of maximum volumes that a three-lane section can support. Um, this particular section also experienced collisions that are susceptible to correction through that four to three conversion, and parking demand is relatively high in this area. Here's a few examples of similar streets within the city that have been restriped to a, uh, to a four to three conversion. Uh, many of these segments have s uh, similar traffic volumes and speeds as Hillcrest, and all continue to operate smoothly without any significant peak period congestion. Um, again, this, this slide just shows a similarity um, of prevailing speeds on Hillcrest compared to other roadway segments that have been converted. All of these uh, streets typically have prevailing speeds in the 40 to 45 mile per hour range, so Hillcrest is within that range. Um, this slide compares average daily traffic volumes of Hillcrest to those of other streets that have been restriped. And again, notice uh, this section of Hillcrest carries uh, between 14,000 and 15,000 vehicles per day, which is within range and well below the traffic carrying capacity of a three-lane section. And one notable example of uh, 
how a four to three conversion could be successful is Avenida de los Arboles, which was restriped in November of 2011. Staff actually conducted a before and after study to determine the effects of the restriping project. Study indicated there were effectively no changes in prevailing speeds or average daily traffic volumes. At the same time, the roadway actually experienced approximately 25% reduction in accidents. Um, and there was a lot of driver validation, um, a lot of motorists calling in to staff and just letting them know they felt more comfortable driving the roadway post-implementation. Um, this chart actually shows the typical collision rates um, for four-lane sections and three-lane sections. The gold bars represent uh, ac collision rates for some segments that, that had the four-lane configuration. And as you can see, those segments all had relatively higher collision rates, and the blue lines represent um, collision rates of three-lane sections, and as you can see, they're a little bit lower. They tend to hover around that dashed line. I'd like to call your attention to the pair of double lines toward the left of the chart. This actually represents accident rates on Arbalis before and after it was restriped um, from a four- to three-lane roadway. As you can see, the accidents decreased considerably after the restriping. And this particular segment of Hillcrest is actually represented by the gold bar furthest to the right. I believe the accident rate on this segment is about five, is, is just over five and a half accidents per million vehicle miles. Um, um, which, as you can tell by the chart, is a little bit higher than average. Uh, while th there are benefits to the 4 to 3 conversion, um, there are also potential impacts uh, depending on traffic patterns and volumes. Intersection levels of service can potentially change due to that reconfiguration. In this case, a preliminary analysis indicates uh, that the intersection of Hillcrest Drive and the 23 ramps, both the northbound and southbound ramps, could experience a slight change in level of service if this were to be implemented, uh, operating at level of service B rather than level of service A during the afternoon peak hour. It would remain at a level of service A during all other times of day. And just, just for your information and perspective, this table provides a general description of level of service grades and, and, what, and what they mean qualitatively. And as you can see, it's just like a report card in school. It ranges from A through F. Um, although we give out E's and the schools don't. Um, as you can see, uh, level of service B is described by good progression and shorter cycle lengths. Um, and it's not until level of service C and D where you start to notice uh, impacts to, to progression, longer cycle lengths, and noticeable congestion. And in terms of the next steps, um, after receiving the commissions and, and, and the public's input this evening, uh, staff uh, recommends proceeding with final design. Uh, we will bring that final design back to the traffic commission for it to approve the design. Um, and then subsequent to that, uh, it, the, the project would go, phase one would, would go to the city council uh, for, for bid authorization. Um, and construction could begin as, as early as fall of, 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 of this year. That, that's phase one. And then phase two, which is all the other segments that we didn't discuss this evening, uh, we'll, we'll continue to uh, perform additional analysis, continue the outreach program, and we'll be identifying uh, candidate segments for the potential phase two of this project. And um, th here's the project website. Um, it's, it's updated as information becomes available. We strongly encourage um, uh, everybody who's interested to, uh, to log on and, uh, and view some of the attachments and, and information that's being provided. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any, uh, any questions. Chair Lemo, or Vice Chair Lemo. No, no I'm sorry. just plain old. Plain old Lemo. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Uh, <laughs> um, I have a strange question slash comment. I have always been a huge... Uh, supporter of the four to three. I think everywhere we've done it, it's worked well. Um, it seems a little counterintuitive to me when I think about this road that a four to five might not net out safer. And, and, and I'll tell you the two areas that are sticking in my mind. Number one, when you leave parking on that street and have a bike lane, I know that there are inherent problems for bicyclists with parked cars and what happens is people get out of parked cars and, and get them with the door. That's number one. Number two, knowing what's happening more globally with Thousand Oaks Boulevard slowing down, partially because of traffic, and it will be slowed down more and more over the next 10 to 12 years as there's more pedestrian-friendly access on that boulevard, a natural alternative is Hillcrest. So it seems to me that from a safety standpoint and possibly, 
without having all the information you have. And possibly from a volume standpoint, that a four to five might work better here. Though no one's, none of them solve the problems for everybody. I understand that. But it seems to me the only real negative of going four to five that you give up for enhanced safety is you lose on street parking. Um, can you sort of correct my thinking so that I go back to just four to three? Yeah. G- great, great point. Uh, uh, I guess vice, vice chair Lemo. Uh, with, with I, as it turns out, I'm just plain old Lemo. Our vice chair is him vice Commissioner, chair Commissioner Lemo. I, I, call, I apologize. Call him, call him Grandpa Lemo. <laughs> Commissioner, that Commissioner is Lemo. the best title I have. Uh, the, the the four to five is similar to the four to three in in, in that it provides that to that, that center turn lane it provides a refuge, and it can reduce it has some of the collision reduction benefits of the three lane, but but not all because when you have two travel lanes in each direction, you have more vehicle to vehicle interaction. So a lot of those lane changes and side side swipe conflicts they'll still uh, they will not be a, addressed as effectively with the five lane configuration as it would be with the three lane configuration. In addition to the parking impacts, there is also the potential um, for slightly to, to encourage slightly higher speeds with the five lane configuration, uh, simply because things will feel more open. And I know a lot of residents in the area and motorists also have concerns about higher traffic speeds. And going to a five-lane configuration uh, may not help combat those concerns. Um, and not to mention what one last drawback of the five-lane configuration. Um, it, it does bring the traveled way closer to people's, uh, to, to residences, closer to homes, and there's just less of a buffer. Um, so, so those are just some of the differentiation between a five-lane and a three-lane, for your information. Thank you. Commissioner Vice Lemo, Chair can McMahon. I make one comment real quick? Oh. It's just directly for Commissioner Lemo. Yes, sir. Um, something else to consider, that area, especially between Houghton Camp and the 23, it's very densely populated. And a lot of those homes, they don't just have two cars. I mean, there's quite a few of them that have four, five, and six cars. I've been in those homes. Um, so that would be a big issue. I don't know where those people would park. Um, you would drive them into Houston, Teal Boulevard. There's a lot of areas, but it would significantly, I think, impact some of those residents um, because they're not going to be able to get them all in the driveway. That's but a huge issue, and you're right. Something it's to consider. a very good point. Vice Chair McMahon. That was actually my point because I know that there are a lot of residents in a small area that need that parking. That was That was what I was going to say. Commissioner Gregory. Yeah, I know this area very well, and I think, uh, you know, I think the uh, four to three will work great for it. Uh, I see the parking that's been talked about, and I'm pretty sure those residents won't want to give up those extra spots. I don't even know where they would really park them because the side streets are pretty far away. It'd cause a conflict. The one thing I would bring up, though, um, would be since you're looking at doing some restriping in that area, <clears throat> would be uh, eastbound for the 23 ramp going northbound. Uh, it's very short. It stacks up. Uh, I, it holds very few cars, uh, therefore stacking up cars on the right-of-way. So if that was a single lane right there, that would that would pose a problem. So you're going to have to look somehow at mitigating that, that left-hand northbound turn lane right there uh, to accommodate more more flow. Oh, um, I, I just wanted to clarify, uh, Commissioner Gregory. So you're saying the eastbound, eastbound Hillcrest approaching the north, the 23 northbound ramps? Correct. Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, as it's configured right now, it holds maybe four cars. <laughs> yeah. The- <laughs> maybe. And, you know, you try to, like, split the line there to try to not block the traffic from going through. But it happens, and it's happened to me numerous times because I do have... Yeah, we, we've got a back to... I, I believe there's a back-to-back turn lane there. W- one per turn pocket serves yeah. eastbound to northbound. Yeah. One serves westbound to southbound. And there's a limited... I don't know what can be done, mm-hmm. but, you know, I would certainly look at that conflict. Sure. And if, again, uh, if that's a single lane there, <laughs> you you will bottleneck the traffic right there. You'll bring it to a stop. So yeah, and, you're going to have can... to do something to consider that spot. 
that's that's a great point, and um, we, we we can look at transitions and dis and, and other right. design details during as, as we move forward in the process, and we'll certainly take that into consideration. All right. Uh, what the, the 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 potential issue other that you just that, mentioned? I think this is great. That street uh, just is ideal for this, and uh, I think it'll be very successful. Thank you. So I um, will fi uh, make my comments that are um, not compelling lately. I don't mean anything other than this is just what I observe. Having gone through the Avenida de los Arbolas uh, road restriping, which was the um, whole street approach to um, creating something, a space for each user to be. I mean, we had a lot of concerns. We probably had at one public meeting, I'm sure we had 15 speakers, plus we had speaker uh, or comment cards in addition to that. And um, we, we were looking at a volume of cars every day that was much higher than what we have on Hillcrest. So I think there we were looking at, we were just knocking on the door of the maximum number of vehicles that can travel down that road for us to successfully accomplish the road restriping for that whole street Three, you know, four to three configuration, but it worked. It was really a, a success. So looking at Hillcrest, even with the future development of, Santa, uh, of um, Thousand Oaks Boulevard into a much more, uh, uh, well, enhancing the uh, commercial, it's already a commercial entity, but like renew, renovating it and bringing in more um, modern buildings, it's going to be a neat place to go. I think we, we are looking at more traffic, but I think we also have some um, parking issues that are being considered by uh, the whole project. Um, on Hillcrest, I see that by going to from four lanes to three lanes, the one thing that sticks in my mind is that we're creating a safe way to use that road if you're a, a cyclist, if you are parking your car, if you are a pedestrian crossing the street, you know, I think there's no uh, you, you, limiting the uh, distance that I have to travel crossing the road from two lanes to one travel lane makes me feel safer. And I, I, I think about all the people that do use the, the street who are residents there in terms of gaining access to that road. So that's, you know, I'm actually looking forward to the design. And I don't know what will really come about because you guys have the experts who will work with you and you'll create something that, you know, then we'll be hearing again. So I just, I'm keeping an open mind to seeing how the four to three conversion works. And um, so, so far I'm, I'm, I'm very favored. I'm very favorable towards the, um, the first phase. Uh, but with that said, I'm going to um, close comments for um, commissioners and I'm going to open up public comments um, if you let me let me go back to my so I don't miss misspeak. Um, at this point, anyone wishing to address the commission on this agenda item may do so by filling out a purple speaker card or a blue written statement card. Um, we have three speaker cards at this point. Uh, speakers are allotted five minutes each. Uh, I will call your name and ask you to state your name and city of residence for the record. Our first speaker is Steve Lamos. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, I'd like to say I'm in favor of the uh, four to three. Uh, we need a left turn lane. I mean, I live on the corner of Flitner and Hillcrest, and those intersections, they're off. They're off they're staggered. Even at Houston, they're staggered. So, I mean, I've seen it where, you know, I'm coming into trying to turn on to Flitner, going west or eastbound, and cars will actually, sorry, go be behind me trying to make a left turn on the Flitner the other way, and cars start backing up, and all of a sudden I can't make my turn, and vice versa, they can't make their turn, so now they're stagnant. Cars will pull out, and there's a, there's a side swipe because everybody starts trying to get out of that lane. So, I mean, it's definitely... D definitely needs to be looked at. I mean, it's, you know, it's like I kind of heard someone say it's a no-brainer. This is one of those no-brainers. Uh, you know, that could be voided by, you know, additional speed, you know, because people are going, I saw in the report, pushing 45. Uh, you know, don't go 40. You know, we don't want it to go to 45, keep it at 40. I mean, it's 40 already through there, so I don't think, you know, you know, seeing the uh, Calais Olivo 
speed bump process. I already know the police are already extended enough, so they're not. You know, I'm not, you're not going to see any, a bigger police presence there. Uh, and then, kind of noticed today coming back from Petco, we already have a modified three lane in progress from the Sears to Moore Park Road. I mean, that center lane is dedicated to go straight. The right turn is a right turn lane. The left turn will actually turn into two left turn lanes going northbound. So it's already there. It's in place. And from Moore Park to uh, Houghton Camp, I mean, yeah, it opens up to 45 in that business area, but I mean, it's already restricted. So, I mean, continue right on through. Uh, let's see, and then pretty much, like I said, I'm in favor and we really just, I mean, the five lane, it's not going to work because I mean, there, it is really highly density populated area with the homes and need parking. I wish I had to see it go a little further around the corner for me and I get a little more parking because I'm in that corner and my vehicle is stuck up on. I forgot what Benson Way what kind of comes around on that corner there. So I'm for, for the three. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Any questions? <clears throat> okay, Mike Bavaro is our next speaker. Please state your name and city of residence for the record. I'm Mike Bavaro from city. Live, live, live actually on uh, Houston, so... In the city of Thousand Oaks. I'm actually, yeah, I guess, in opposition to changing the striping from the existing striping. Uh, I was there back in 81 when it was a two-lane and there was a stop sign at the corner of Houston in Hillcrest. Uh, they changed. When you took that, took out that stop, you basically opened it up to a higher, higher volume. And at one stage, that was at 35, and then you raised it up to 40. Uh, the other one of the few, one of the few things I would say is that uh, I noticed that we got a lack of notification for the various meetings that were held for this. I had a couple of them. I had two of them come in the day after the meeting, so that I could not even attend the meeting. I did attend the February meeting and made comments on the boards on the scratch pads they had there. Um, our, you know. The Arbor Ease 4 to 3 has, has a unique feature in the fact that on one end of it has a stop sign. You can't go through that straight. You've got to stop at the end of, end of that, that stretch. Uh, I have also uh, concerns about changing the speed up. It, it should stay, you know, I would suggest cutting it back down to 35, but I know that, you know, it was raised up at one time because they considered it going faster. Um, and I have safety issues in the fact that right now you've got four lanes going all the way through. Uh, you know, coming once once you leave Moore Park, the Moore Park Road, and go all the way through, you got a four lane road all the way. Now you're going to have bottleneck. You're going to bottleneck going into the residential area on both ends. So basically, you're going to expand the possibility of safety. You know, possibility trying to trying to cramp those vehicles in there most of the time the only time we really have major hiccups on that road is when 101 gets cut off uh, that's it any questions well I just have a, a comment now you referred to the stop sign on Avenue de Dulles Arbalest have you driven that recently yes I have because there's no stop sign that at that, that, that the end of Arbalees there is a three-way stop by the Chevron station there are no oh, lights. Oh, oh. There are no lights between the the freeway and that that one. That's a straight shot, but you have a stop sign, a dedicated stop sign at that point, which everybody's aware of. So that you know, they definitely won't keep trying to. There's no way to speed through that intersection. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay. Commissioner Gregory? Yeah, uh, one of the purposes of this is to avoid the left hand turn conflicts and the side swipes. Uh, I didn't hear anything from you regarding that issue. I mean, that, you know, if we do something, that will still exist. We, there have been X amount of rear ends going into Houston that I, that I know of personally. Uh, I even know that there were two deaths on that. On that coming out of that, coming from the other way, coming from Thousand Oaks Boulevard onto Hillcrest, uh, you know. So you know, I've seen most of them. 
you know, when when we hear it hit, we know we know what you know, we know right. what happened. So it doesn't matter which way, whether eastbound or westbound, you know, we know that there there is an issue there, and most of the time it's because somebody doesn't pay attention. Right. So the purpose of this under consideration is to try to eliminate that as best as possible. Well, I, and I, I and I do understand the speed. I mean, I do travel that quite a yeah. bit. I mean, you have to go pretty fast to make that light down there at Holden Camp if you're going all the way through. I always get stuck at that light. I see it changing in front of me. I don't even try to make that light. I know it's going to change before I get there. So uh, I'm sure they would probably consider all those things, light timing. Yeah. Okay. I'm ahead of myself. I just wanted to bring up the left-hand turn conflict. That's, that's so, get your feedback. So thank you for confirming. Yeah. Anything Thank you, else? sir. Nope. Okay. Our last speaker is Alex McDonald. Mr. McDonald, if you could repeat your name and city of residence for the record, please. Good evening, uh, commissioners. My name is Alex McDonald, and I live on Hillcrest Drive uh, in between uh, Houghton Camp and the 23. Um, I can't say how uh, how enthusiastic I am at the prospects of the four to three conversion. I've had one vehicle totaled on the roadway. I've been uh, first on scene as a as a, as a citizen to several accidents. One actually last weekend where we had a rollover collision on the roadway. Um, so I've seen firsthand what happens uh, when we have too many cars and we have that side side swipe uh, potential. Um, you know, it's it's not just about traffic speeds and travel times here. It's also about public safety. Um, you know, I'm sure everybody is aware of how many pedestrians cross the roadway there, how many cyclists use the ro roadway, and basically uh, drivers as well. Because you know, just because you're in a car doesn't mean you're immune from the hazards of the road. Um, adding these uh, adding these refuges, safe refuges, be it parking lane, bike lanes, center turn lane. Uh, is going to give a much greater margin of safety, and uh, it, it can't it can't come soon enough. Um, also, I think it should be uh, brought you know to to the table. You know, we talk about the influx of traffic when you know uh, Thousand Oaks Boulevard gets more developed um, with the you know the general plan there. However, um, you know we've broken ground on a 23 101 interchange. Um, project, which I also believe is going to greatly reduce the traffic volumes both on Thousand Oaks Boulevard and Hillcrest, because we all have done it. The 101 is a complete uh, parking lot when you get past um, Westlake Boulevard in Hampshire specifically. So we say, well, let's take Hillcrest. Well, you know, uh, based on what, I, what I've read about that project on the 23 101, I have a feeling that's going to be a much more cohesive interchange, and I believe that we're also going to see a great reduction in traffic uh, by virtue of that on Hillcrest and Thousand Oaks Boulevard. So, uh, you know, I just, uh, it's, it's a bigger picture, safety, and, the, and you know, the traffic uh, routes uh, throughout the city. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. McDonald? No, but I, I, I do agree with, uh, with the, again, the more global look, and I think you're absolutely right. Hopefully that, won't, that can't come soon enough either. I have a request for staff when you bring this to us at our next um, commission meeting. Could you please um, have looked at the uh, statement about deaths specifically that may have occurred or, you know, ser serious accidents, if we could really look at that specifically and see if we understood the, the cause, if we can. Sure. We, we will that include that in our know. future uh, uh, presentations to the commission. Thank you. Commissioner Engler. I know I can tell you, at least in the last five years, we have not had any fatalities on that section of roadway. Thank you. For the record, we have received seven communications, some email, some in letters. Um, they are both for this program, um, opposed to this program, requesting clarification on this program. And I think that some of the um, challenges we face is communicating each of the phases of the program um, that we're proposing. So we're looking at uh, phase one now, but I, again, uh, I do want to acknowledge that we have had an equal 
a number divided in three of um, requesting better clarification that we communicate better uh, what the um, project looks like uh, for the project as well as an op opposition to the project. So again, I appreciate the uh, community participation. Okay. Oh, didn't do that. Didn't do that. <laughs> Okay, uh, we are now at item 8C, the Bicycle Advisory Team Recommendations and School Safety Team uh, Monthly Status Report, um, which was provided for each of you uh, in your packets. Any questions? Um, I will say that the uh, School Safety Team is meeting at um, in Newbury Park in the Dos Vientos area at the uh, look at the uh, Sycamore uh, Canyon Elementary School parking and uh, drop off and pick up. Um, item nine is status report for prior of uh, tra the prior traffic commission recommendations. Um, staff, did you want to comment anything about this? Uh, next next week at the city council meeting, we'll have the Calle Levo uh, being presented. Uh, as a uh, department report with with the traffic commission recommendation to go ahead and uh, approve the the speed request or speed hump request okay item 10 commission referrals for uh from january 29th 2004 um do you want to clarify this for me Okay, I think at the uh, at the January meeting uh, there was a request made to provide some uh, additional information on Westlake Boulevard uh, between 101 and, and headed as you travel south. There was uh, the city received a grant for sidewalk improvements. Uh, we'll have the engineer who's working on that project here and uh, do a little PowerPoint and give you uh, more information on that. I, I believe they're going to um, they have a council item on. Um, Next next Tuesday as well on that item. Okay, now we move to item eleven, our work program and commission schedule. Um. Which is on page 52. <laughs> I got it. Okay. All right, so I'll just read it. Is that what you'd like me to do, Staff? You want me to read it? We've got the. Uh, yeah, it's, it's just there for information, just so that um, you can see what what's coming up uh, in the in the months ahead. We have, uh, I believe, what, five items there. Uh, the next meeting will probably cover the Westlake Boulevard to Valley Spring uh, request to look at the stop sign that's there, as well as our school crossing guard program, our annual report on that. Uh, and, I, and I actually have a, a comment and a question. It's, it seems that for the entire time I've been on this commission, we have been dealing with the Westlake Boulevard and Valley Spring Drive in some way, shape, or form. And so uh, to say I'm excited that, that we're getting somewhere maybe further down the road on that is an understatement. That being said, how does this work schedule fit into our consideration coming up on whether or not to cancel the April 16th meeting when there are two items on this work schedule that you think would pretty much take up our, our next meeting? Will you be giving us a recommendation of what it does to the workload uh, should we cancel the April 16th meeting? Yeah, both both of these items they're not um, uh, under any you know deadlines or anything like that where we have to take the item then to city council or, or anything like that. So uh, there's flexibility if if this the April meeting was canceled. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, okay, now we move to item 12, Traffic Commission comments and discussion. Um, Mr. Lemo? And I have, I have two comments, both uh, somewhat related to uh, J.C. Simon. First of all, uh, he mentioned that there was going to be the ride of silence, and uh, uh, most of our commissioners remember this, but he, he, the public might not. Uh, actually, one of our traffic commissioners, while he was a sitting traffic commissioner, was actually killed in a bike accident. Uh, and that's Commissioner uh, Glenn Garvin. So that's just sort of somebody we kind of try and remember, especially uh, on that night. And uh, it has always been on a Wednesday night, and so that's we've always had to delay the start of our meeting for that. And then the other thing, which is a much lighter note, and that is um, around that same period of time we are once again hosting uh, through the efforts of our uh, our wonderful city staff and management and the uh, Chamber of Commerce, as well as the Thousand Oaks um, uh, tra uh, Hotel bid. TID is what it, it stands for, and boy, if I could remember what those initials are. But from that, that group and the, and the wonderful folks at Amgen, we're hosting the Amgen Tour again here uh, in Thousand Oaks, which is huge, uh, not only for our community, but absolutely for the biking community. So um, I just wanted to raise those two points. Mr. McMahon. Um, I would like to know how staff feels about um, not canceling the April meeting and canceling the May meeting because those of us who ride in the ride of silence, um, it would make it better that we wouldn't have to miss half the meeting or, or avoid it or change the meeting time. And also I know that um, Kathy Lowry is in charge of volunteers for – um, all of that Amgen tour, and I would imagine that six oh, days yeah. before the tour, or five days before the tour, I don't know if she is going to be involved, but she's the school crossing guard program coordinator, and if she's got to talk in May, that, that might be bad. So I wonder if she could do that in April, and we skip the May meeting. Is that possible? Before you answer, Commissioner McMahon. Tom Gregory. <laughs> just call me Tom. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I just have a little feedback because that is real close to Easter, number one. But personally, I won't be in town. I have personal family business. I have to be out of town. Uh, so just make sh uh, on a in April. In April. And I'm actually leaving next Thursday, and I won't be back till April 22nd. So... Uh, just to let you know, if you're going to have a quorum, you cannot count me in. Okay, I'm already committed. So, But those are all good points, and, you know, please go ahead and have a meeting if it makes sense. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Sergeant Harwood. A couple of comments um, regarding the right of silence that Mr. Lemo talked about. I got involved in it three years ago, didn't know much about it. Um, we got asked to help out to make it safe for the riders. Um, I've done it the last three years, and I have to tell you, it's a really neat experience. Um, great group of people. It makes you feel good. Um, I, I think it's a really good thing that we do in this city. Um, I even went to the point that I reached out to Oxnard PD. I have friends over there because they were trying to get a similar ride going. I worked with JC. Um, I got my fellow motors from Oxnard to get involved and help them out with their ride. Um, the other thing regarding Kathy Lowry, I've been going to all these Amgen meetings and she's going to be really busy five days before that race. It's a, it's a huge undertaking for city staff, the police department. Um, so it's very considerate of you to think about cause she's going to have a lot going on. It's my understanding. She's going to, she's looking for 350 volunteers that Correct. she's going to be, she's responsible for yeah. all volunteers for the whole, whole event. <laughs> Um, and it's a massive undertaking, mm -hmm. so she'll be busy. And I'm um, sorry, Chair, um, just to mention the police department for Thousand Oaks. I've been doing this ride of silence on my bike for a very long time. It's it, like, like the sergeant said, it is a wonderful thing. But what one thing that makes it wonderful is the participation of our police department. They are they are on their bikes riding with us. They are there stopping traffic. They are so supportive, and it makes us feel very 
protected and special and <laughs> And we love it. And it, it it's very meaningful in so many different ways. But the fact that our city and our city police all support this is just a wonderful, wonderful thing. It, it makes – it's one of the many things that make our city very, very special. Uh, I just wanted to uh, reflect on – in terms of looking at our work schedule – um, if nothing's really time sensitive, um, we can wait till May. I also wonder if we can't um, look at ske- wh- when we really need to address these things. Um, I I felt last year that we need if we were to have a for- a quorum as a traffic commission that knowing that we had at least one commissioner riding in the uh, ri- partic- participating in the ride. You know, really, it, it sort of took it away from the rest, from anyone else who wanted to participate. And I would love to participate. And I also would like to support the importance of the right of silence. But of all place, of all groups, you know, we really can't if we ske- knowingly schedule a meeting on the same day. So I just wanted to throw that back at you to question about, you know, like, wh- what can we do with our schedule? Okay, uh, w- one thing, okay, I think in the resolution that uh, created the Traffic Commission, I believe it's called out as a third Wednesday uh, of each month, one thing we can do is uh, you could choose an alternative um, Wednesday instead of uh, for for like the month of May, we can move back one week. Uh, that would be the fourth Wednesday of of May. That would be May 28th. Or or forward, uh, May fourteenth. The current meeting would be scheduled on which day in May would the current meeting be scheduled on? Would it be scheduled on the twenty first if it was just in its regular schedule? Okay, yes. and so that's after everything's done. It's after Amgen. It's after CLU's graduation. It's after all the things going, including. Uh, it's after the ride of, of silence is what day? Oh, the ride of silence is actually on the twenty-first. Okay, so then the only date that you could do it on would be the twenty-eighth, um, and that is a five-week month. Now, unfortunately, well, that's just before Memorial Day. I I couldn't be here because those are when we move the hospital board meetings, and I'm uh, chair of the hospital board. So um, I think we have to keep it on a Wednesday if we move it. I'm almost wondering if if we were to skip the meeting in um, in April, if May seventh is a possibility, which still causes a, at least somewhat of a gap um, before the Amgen events. How does how does staff feel about that? Uh, I believe that that would work for for staff. I have a question. Um, when does the me? youth commission meet? <laughs> yeah, we don't we don't have that schedule in front of us. Uh, what we what we could probably do is is maybe check for the seventh. Obviously, if that's the youth commission's regular night, they're meeting. Though, I also know that as they get towards the end of prom season, the school year, and all that, they they begin wrapping up a little. So, why don't we? My suggestion would be that we. Uh, Try and do everything uh, possible to schedule it on May the 7th. And, I mean, literally we could meet anywhere except for this is the only place that you can televise from, right? Uh, I believe they can, uh, we could check out the Forum Theater if that's available, um, where they, you know, that's where the council meets. We could check that availability. All right, so, I mean, why don't we try and do the 7th? And... And if Youth Commission is meeting that night, it might be the kids might actually get a kick out of meeting in the Forum Theater. The, yes, the uh, the Youth Commission is the May seventh, so, but we could we could find maybe another spot for them if that's what we needed to. Okay, is it is it possible for TOTV to do both, or is that stressing staff there? We'd have to look into that, and we can get back to you. Why don't we just try for May the seventh as the best alternative? I have one last question. How does June feel? Uh, 
I, we're trying really hard to make May work, but what about moving on to Ju- looking at our next meeting being in June away from some of these other events? Commissioner McMahon. Um, we did have, um, I don't know what it was, a note to self, note to the commission that we just wanted to make sure we met every quarter. So we, we would be accomplishing that if we skipped April and May and met in June. Staff? Okay, yes, the third meeting or third Wednesday of June, the 18th, that uh, is, that would work with with staff. It's, that would be our normal meeting date. Okay, I'm personally in favor of um, canceling our April and May meetings and meeting at our next regularly scheduled Wednesday, third Wednesday in June, June 18th. Uh, fellow commissioners? I have a no objection to that. Do you want us to vote? I'll make that motion. And all those in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries 4 0. Okay, we're at item 13, our adjournment. Our next meeting will be held at 6.30 p.m. here in the Oak Room on June 18th, 2014. Actually, this is the boardroom. Um, We are adjourned.